right, everyone. Thanks for watching another episode of The Creative Truth. Today, I'm here with Shannon Lowry, a social media mastermind. Uh, I've done a lot of video projects with Shannon with, through Visit Savannah, and I'm super excited to talk to her. So, Shannon. Hey, Tyler. Hey. <laughs> uh, tell me who you are and what you do. Um, my name is Shannon. <laughs> I am the content and social media manager at Visit Savannah, and I create amazing content for Visit Savannah's social media channels, and I manage our leisure and non-leisure channels, and I basically just try and get people to come to Savannah. And I know you haven't always worked in social, so kind of walk me through like how your career has kind of played out, and what you went to school for, where you're from, and up to where what you do now. Yeah, so like you, um, spoiler alert, I am a Yankee, born. Recovering Yankee. Recovering Yankee, um, destined to be a Southern Belle. Uh, I'm originally from Pittsburgh. I got my degree in dance, and I moved to Savannah in 2014, and I danced with Savannah Ballet Theater for five seasons. Um, and while I was doing that, it was a part-time gig, and while I was doing that, I was got into some administrative work, realized I wanted to be in hospitality, got hired at Visit Savannah at the front desk. Uh, six months into that, I became the social media coordinator. And then two years later, which was just this past year, about a year ago, um, I became the content and social media manager. And so that's kind of how I climbed my way up through Visit Savannah. And I, I stopped dancing ballet professionally about a year ago, and I still kind of perform here and there. So when you were like 17, 18, whatever, like getting out of high school, what was your like dream of what you wanted to do if you had one? I thought I was going to be a ballet company. Like that was the Where? end. Anywhere. Hmm. The end all to be all. I didn't want to be in New York. I didn't want to be in a major city. I didn't think I wanted to be in LA. I wanted to be in kind of like a mid-sized city. Um, at that time, some major places like on my radar were like Atlanta, um, Pittsburgh, uh, Salt Lake City, which is still kind of a major city, but um, at the time, it, it didn't seem quite as overwhelming. Um, Salt Lake City is like a big city for dance or just like? No Both. Before. the So the company there has like a multi-million dollar budget hmm. and the... It's like one of the oldest companies towards the West Coast in the U.S. And, um, I mean, it is like a pretty big, like, metropolitan area, um, similar to, like, Denver and Vegas and stuff. But I wanted to be kind of in a mid to large city in a small, smaller, comparatively, dance company. And I thought that was where I was going to go. And it's kind of what happened, but not in the way that I thought it would. And I can't even, I literally cannot remember. How did you end up in Savannah? I had come here when I was like 14 actually going to ballet camp in Orlando my parents stopped here like we stopped driving from Pennsylvania like as like a halfway point kind of and I fell in love with it and then fast forward kind of like forgot about it this was when I was like 14 fast forward like six seven years later I'm in college my roommate and I also a fellow dancer were sitting on our couch watching House Hunters, and they were in Savannah, and we were both, like, reminded of how beautiful Savannah was, and we sat there, and we held hands, and we were like, if we can go to Savannah, we have to go there, and then we found a company here, and we both auditioned, and we both got in, and we both moved here. Wait, who's that? Avery. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's yes, so funny. I forgot I know. that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we I... All have, we all have a story of, like, how we ended up here. Yeah. yeah. I was I was stuck between moving to Indianapolis staying in Pittsburgh or coming to Savannah. I had like three different company offers and my parents drove me to Savannah like two days before I graduated college. Like we just packed up the car and drove down here in like a day um, and then drove back. And it only took like just getting here and being here for a few hours to be like, oh yeah, like this is where it's at. So. Um, so tell me, so this podcast, for a little background, this podcast is called The Creative Truth. And it's basically I'm talking to artists and people that perform like have a non-traditional 
a career or income, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's a way to kind of give advice, you know, give some pitfalls to avoid. And for me, my background is all in video, but now I'm a full fledged podcaster, and uh, so you know, like you kind of follow this a little bit. And there's a lot I would change along the way. So for some context, um, how do you make most of your money? I make most of my money at Visit Savannah right now. Um, it hasn't always been that way. I, this is my first full-time job. Visit Savannah was the full, first full place I ever salary, worked. Full-time, yes. benefits. And even then, I didn't go salaried at Visit Savannah until this year. How about dance? How about that? Like, dance was always work? supplemental income. Mm -hmm. The only time that I made full-time, I made all of my money from something dance-related was when I first moved to Savannah and I was making money dancing for the ballet company and then teaching. And that was my full-time, like, gig. So I was a full-time independent contractor as a dance teacher. And then I kind of started to, like, do less of that and do more administrative work part-time. And then until I was at Visit Savannah, that was my first full-time thing. And did – so, like, when you started Visit Savannah, I know you were looking for ways to kind of move up, but mm -hmm. you didn't think you – actually, I know this to be true. You didn't even really have social media for yourself. No. So you didn't think, like, oh, maybe I could manage the social media channels. No, I didn't even really know that that was a thing. I knew I wanted to move up in the organization. I knew that there were, I was capable of doing a lot of different jobs. Uh, I was kind of focused on either going up the marketing ladder or up mm -hmm. the sales ladder, um, kind of whichever one presented an opportunity first. Not and, too late. Mm, <laughs> I'm going to stay on my marketing side of the river. And um, yeah, so it, it worked out. Um, so, so let's see. see. So, so you, uh, you and I, mm -hmm. this is weird too, because I feel like you outshine me in front of the microphone. No, you don't. I'm, no. I'm more of the, like, behind the scenes guy typically, but we produce videos, um, where I'm behind the camera and like, we brainstorm ideas and then you were doing like crazy things like going in the ocean with flip flops or with, um, uh, what do we call them? Uh, flippers. flippers yeah. yeah. Or, or like. Have, like, like looking at things with binoculars, with binoculars and there's tourists walking by and just, just like all this crazy stuff, stuff that I would never do. But like you, you put, put yourself out there. I have no shame. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and like is, is that, that just part of like who you are or is that part of like the performance background or like where does that? I think it's a little bit of both. For instance, like when it comes to a show, I mean, you do anything for a character. There's but the more you can be above and beyond and, and bigger, larger than life, the better for like on stage, like live acting. Um, so I ha definitely have that in my back pocket. But also, I just think me as a person, I don't, especially as I've gotten older, I don't really have a whole lot of shame. It's like I was just walking down the street in a hot dog costume two weeks ago for Halloween. And honestly, I forgot I had it on. That's just how much I didn't even think about it. <laughs> But you even like you didn't have to, but you called yourself out too. You're like, oh, by the way, I'm in a hot dog costume. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Just so people knew. Just so people know. Don't, Don't be mean. mean. <laughs> yeah, be, and people were still mean, but whatever. Which, Which we'll, we'll get, get to. to. We'll, we will get to that. Okay. Um, through through as you're like coming up to the ranks, like whether that's through college or after college, like were there certain people you met, or was there, were there certain like coincidences that happened? What were your big breaks that kind of like helped you elevate and move up? Um, I mean, at least before I kind of came to Savannah and got a little established with the community here, um, I always had this feeling when I was in college that just like I was destined to like move on from that, that I wasn't going to just like get stuck after I graduated and, you know, especially for dancers and for dancers in a college program, you know, we just, and, and keep in mind when I'm in college, I still didn't have an idea of what I wanted to do, like, professionally, quote-unquote. I just still thought dance was it. Like, dance was all I was focused on. Um, I didn't – I knew somehow that no matter what, I was not going to end up just kind of letting dance fall by the wayside and not having any direction. I knew that I would somehow figure it out one way or the other. Um, and my mom was really instrumental in that because her career throughout her life took a lot of different twists and turns. And to me, it's like, well, she ended up fine and What'd happy. So she, she went to school for art, wanted to be an artist, traveled and studied abroad for like a year, moved back to the States and her mother passed away. And then she like finished school and then 
she worked in a big like PR job for Virginia Episcopal Seminary. And then after that, met my dad and went to nursing school. And then she was like a teacher. She got her teaching degree. Like she went all over the map just to kind of make stuff work and make ends meet and keep broadening her horizons and stuff. And it, sometimes it led to dead ends. Like I don't think she loved all of those things that she did, but she always had a willingness to try something new. And so I felt like I had that too. And so I kind of relied on that to get me through. But then when I came to Savannah, there were some mentors that I had that were really instrumental in guiding me to where I'm at now. You know, I had a supervisor at a part-time like uh, exercise job at the marshes of Skidaway Island. And she was amazing. And she was the one that told me like, visit Savannah is the place to be. If you can get in there, get your foot in. And she did everything she could to help me, you know, beef up my resume and, and everything like that. She was really good. Men- she was a really good mentor. Um, and getting me here. That was Michelle Rice. If she listens to this, she'll know it's her. Shout out, Michelle. We're supposed to have lunch next week. I need to respond to your Facebook message because I forgot today. Um, But yeah, um, so she was really instrumental in encouraging me, and and I was lucky to just kind of cross paths with people. Mava Beard is another one that helped me kind of get in the door at Visit Savannah. Did you say that? What? Did you say that? Bird? Beard? I don't know. Sorry, Mava. I don't know how to say your name. Mava. Mava. No, Miss Mava. Mava. We all know Mava, and um, Mava was really also very instrumental, um, which I didn't know until later, which was also kind of cool. Mm-hmm. So, Wait, so how'd you meet her? I met Mava through the church that I was working at okay. when I was looking for full-time work, and I, I told Mava that I knew she worked here, uh, or vi- worked here, worked at Visit Savannah, um, and I told Mava in confidence one time, because obviously she, I was on, on the clock for the church. <laughs> Yeah. And I told Mava that, you know, I was really looking for full-time work. I'd heard really good things about Visit Savannah. Um, if there were any openings, if she could just keep me in mind. And six months later, I got a phone call for an interview. So Six months later. So she, like, I know, would say it was probably, I was almost about six months, yeah. You, she was just, like, you know, like, hmm, oh, yeah, I remember Shannon saying something. And, yeah, yeah, because originally I thought it was somebody else that put my name forward, and then I found out later it was Mava, and I was like, oh, wow, I can't even believe she, really like, remembered that, you yeah. know? So cool. Yeah. Yeah, you never know. Really, like who knows who or whatever. Yeah. Um so tell me I wanna hear more about like the nitty gritty of the progression of everything after like the front desk. So you're answering phones and then they're like, Hey, we want you to come in and um manage our social media accounts and I know that there was a thing on like your first St. Patrick's Day, mm. and then and then now you are an authority in town, at least in town. Like I don't want to say like you're in global, like you're not like faint to me. You're famous, but like in town, people like it's to a point where it's like kind of creepy. People know who you are, and they like see you on the street. And, like, yeah. <laughs> so like, walk me through. You were answering phones, and then they want you to manage the social media accounts to, like, where we're at now, and the skills that came with that. Okay, so when I when I started at the front desk, like, I and, – and Joe, the president at F- Visit Savannah, knew this and told me this during my interview, that this was not – the front desk was not my forever desk. Like, he knew that that was something I was going to outgrow very quickly, and I did. And I would say after probably six – I was getting at the, about the six-month mark, and I was starting to – you know, if I'm not going to move out of this, I don't know how long I can stay here. I just was not being challenged, you know, in any way um, or in a lot of ways. Um, And it it wasn't anybody's fault. It's just the nature of the position and the nature of where I was at my age and in my career. But um, luckily, I had been invited to start shadowing the marketing team and coming to like the weekly marketing meetings. And so I was really adamant in those meetings about like, please just let me be involved in any projects or any meetings or, you know, just listen to things, you know, whatever it is, like I I just want to learn. Um, and so at about the six month mark, I was getting really restless. And luckily, this position opened up, there was a shift. Um, and I also advocated for myself. So that was when um, our marketing I don't remember what her title was, marketing manager, I think, at the time left and I approached the VP of marketing and said, you know, I want to know if this is going to open anything up. Is there going to be any shifts? I'm interested. Please put my name in. And luckily there was. So then I became the social media coordinator and then that was really challenging. It was much more overwhelming from the desk than what I 
even expected. I knew it was going to be a much higher level job, but, um, and the workload would be a lot more, but I was not expecting what it was. And I think I stayed my first full week. I remember being in the office that Friday night until like eight or nine o'clock, like finishing just my weekly load, which was in hindsight compared to what I do now, like not even that much. I just was not used to it. Um, so that was kind of hard and I went through a lot of learning curves there. Um, it was just a lot more writing and working on social media platforms, which was not something that I had any prior experience in. I didn't even, I didn't, I had never had a Twitter. I didn't even know how to do half of the stuff that is just like, you know, small fries now. Mm -hmm. Um, so I did all of that. Yeah. I had to go through like some of the, like paying my dues stuff, like Facebook living the St. Patrick's Day Parade, which was tough because it's my favorite day of the year, and I always hang out with my friends and my family, and now I had to... Wasn't there some caption, too, that was, like, too informal? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the Instagram story I made about it. Oh, yeah. So I made this Instagram story promoting St. Patrick's Day decor, like, a Get week lit. before St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. Oh, wait, no. I think I did say these decorations are lit. Yeah, I know. You look back now, and you're like, God, how... Would, like, I, what yeah, was... but now you could actually get away with it, though. Yeah, I now like, I could, yeah. but yeah, um, back then, the, yeah, the, that wasn't the brand voice, and it, yeah, it wasn't my voice, clearly, and yeah, I had to go through some learning curves and some tough little slaps on the wrist to get up to par a little bit. Um, so, and now you basically, like, help shape the voice, and mm -hmm. we'll get to, we'll talk 2020 and COVID and all that in a little mm -hmm. bit, but like... Now, when people are just mean, like pointlessly mean, you're kind of taking this approach of like, we're going to not be mean back, but like, we're going to clap back a little bit. Clap back culture. Um, yeah, part of it's like social media culture. Part of it is my individual personality. I don't like to take things laying down. I have, I think, pretty strong comebacks, even if I don't always verbalize them. They're generally rolling in my head. Um yeah, I mean, with more trust from my leadership and just more freedom, as everybody gets busier and everyone's bandwidth gets more and more stretched out, it kind of gives me a little more leadway to, like, get away with stuff. And the few times that I've done that, it's been really successful, which is good because I can go back to my supervisor and say, hey, I know you said I shouldn't do this, but I did and it was really well received so maybe we can start doing that more and so yeah so I definitely have a little bit more sass now on the account when it comes to just like the really hateful stuff because mm -hmm. it's just it is honestly wearing in anybody out there that is a social media manager knows how or not, even not a social media manager it's just awful sometimes yeah mm -hmm. and in um and in at least in like the DMO which DMO most people don't know stands for destination marketing or organization um visit savannah is like pretty well known for being fairly groundbreaking in a lot of our social mm -hmm. like efforts maybe the podcast too which, definitely which, the podcast yeah which like so shout out we produce another podcast shannon and i produce where she's the host and i'm the producer called savannah georgia anything but ordinary you can find that drop a link below uh, but if you're listening it's visit savannah.com slash podcast and so you'll get to listen to hours and hours of Shannon, not me, and uh, we, <laughs> we like it that way. But um, but that's like um, that's kind of a nice little segue. Like so, you like you Facebook Live, and now they've rolled out Reels, and like it's always evolving and changing. You have to stay current. You have to like you can't do it the way things have always done it. What are some skills that you want to add to your repertoire in 2021 and moving forward? Um, even though there's such a focus on social media and writing for social media and writing for digital, I have always wanted to be a well-respected, well-respected writer. And so I think getting my writing skills and my formal writing skills really strong is, is something that I personally and professionally strive for. Um, you know, I still, even though, you know, I remember when I was really excited to write my first article for visitsavannah.com and now I'm thinking, well, how can I get on, how can I get on travel and leisure? Or like the post just published an article of a local author here in Savannah 
um, a couple weeks ago, you know, how can, how can I be doing that? You know, I want to kind of be in these more classic publications and stuff because I feel like I started with the digital space. So now to kind of backtrack, whereas most people start in more traditional publications and then move into the, you know, modern digital space of social and all that. Mm. So for me, that's my big one. Um, I wanted to also ask you about like specifically what that social load looks like. Cause I know there's more to it than just like, Oh yeah, anyone can post on Facebook. I know you're writing an original caption mm-hmm. for every, and not only that, you're tracking it, putting it in a database and people are then ripping you off. So like, what is that? What is that load? Like what, what does that entail? Scheduling all like how, what accounts are out there and, and like, and there's even more that I don't know about. Mm-hmm. Because, like, the other day I had stuff for the CRM approved for me, and I'm like, oh, I didn't even know that that was you guys. Yeah, so, like, on a daily basis or on a week, many, weekly how many, basis. Yeah, how, many, how many posts? Like, yeah, on a weekly basis we post on – and I only handle Visit Savannah now. I used to handle Visit Savannah, the Savannah Chamber, Savannah Meetings and Conventions, and Savannah Sports Council. Um, I now only handle just Visit Savannah. It has so many followers that the community management time load on it is a lot higher than it's ever been. Um, So we do that, and then we have another coordinator that handles those other um, non-leisure accounts. But on Visit Savannah alone, we post on Facebook twice a day. We post on Twitter three times a day, which it used to be ten times a day, and that was a lot, and I'm glad it's not that much anymore. Twitter is not my favorite platform. But so we do three posts on Twitter. We do one post on Instagram, intermixed in there. Weekly is usually at least one or two Instagram stories or uh, reels, which we create totally in-house. We gather the content ourselves. I make the any of the graphics that are going that we create in like Spark or anything like that. I'm making those myself or I'm building them in the platform myself. Um, we do, we shoot for at least one Facebook Live a week as well, um, which the community management time on those is really high because we get so much engagement. Um, so community management on a, on a daily basis probably takes at least an, an hour, maybe two hours just out of my week, regular old work day, um, out of my like seven and a half hours or whatever it is. And that's like um, liking every comment. Yeah, that's liking every comment, answering every question, all the DMs. Um, just the posts to the page, like all that kind of stuff, Um, answering their questions, just all of that stuff. So that's a heavy load. Um, And then in between all of that, I'm actually sourcing the content for the posts. So all of the photos that go out, we use a third-party service to source the photos. We're making sure that we save them correctly, that we we, we properly optimize them for SEO on the back end with the, with the data on the photos. We save them properly, and then when we go to repost them, we always make sure that we're using the handle of the, of the user to properly credit them. Um, and then they're accompanied by a caption that is totally original. I probably have repeated captions, but not intentionally. I've never just sat there and been like, I can't think of anything today. I'm going to copy and paste something I've already used. Um, So if I have reused things, it's unintentional. I come up with something original every day, and if I can't think of something original, I put it in the parking lot, as we say, and come back to it later until I can come up with something. Um, So all of that on every single post is original, um, at least as far as, like, the photos and stuff. Um, I'm also writing for the website. I'm hosting the podcasts and managing the distribution on the podcasts and um, collecting all of the analysis for all of those posts that I just mentioned and keeping a log of those. And so what happens when other people then just like screenshot your photo and then <laughs> rip your caption off? Um, first of all, I cuss a lot. I have a lot of really mean words to say. I get a phone call. <laughs> yeah, I call Tyler and I'm like, guess what happened today? Um, and then I blacklist those accounts and then i secretly troll them in my dreams um with my black account that one day i will create Some and voodoo, like, m- make like them all uh, sorry which doctor did yeah you i have a i have a voodoo or... doll of all these that has the handle yeah. of all these accounts on them mm-hmm. no we do we get our stuff stolen sometimes and it's really it's really frustrating it's an insult to your work it's an insult to your time it's also and they and it's, people just think like oh it's what a, it's a sentence you know but you're like i just i sat there for a half hour <laughs> mm-hmm. People really think it's not a big deal. For me, for my, like, I think because I, first and foremost, I, I don't know if I consider myself a writer. I would like to one day be able to confidently say that. But I most identify with the writing aspect of my job. And 
So yeah, it feels like they're stealing your thoughts. Second of all, when they steal a photo, it's like, you know, we're the ambassador for the people that took the photo and they trust us to share it appropriately and credit them appropriately. And then to see somebody else not do that and to have stolen it from our account, I feel like it makes us look really bad. And it's frustrating because I know a lot of these photographers and, you know, we'll reach out to them and say, hey, like this account reposted this or whatever or credited us they should have credited you we tried to adjust it i'm so sorry and they get really upset too because nobody wants to have their photos stolen it's just it's just not it's not cool it's not cool in any way and i know like you've kind of um, as you're moving forward like i know you mentioned that community management's like not one of your favorite parts of it no so, like how how would you like to i mean it, it's just there's so much more that goes into it that people don't either realize or understand um and uh so like what are the best parts of it and what are the parts you could like miss me with that you know the best parts of community management there's probably two parts to that the first part is always as as a content manager having tabs on the sentiment of your audience so i wake up and i check the accounts and i know exactly how my audience is feeling and reacting and what they're saying and how a piece is doing and you just feel very plugged in and tapped into the online conversation which I don't necessarily feel for instance we have a weekend manager I don't feel like I'm that plugged into what happens over the weekend because I don't I'm not managing it um which is fine for a two-day period but I think I think it would affect my ability um to a certain extent in what I do if I didn't do it every day so that's kind of like the catch-22 of it um, but it, it's a good thing that I am always plugged in like that. I also really like reading the positive feedback. I mean, I get really good stuff sometimes and it's nice that people enjoy the work that we do and, and people seem to identify with me sometimes and that's really fun. Um, but on the flip side of it, the negativity on the internet is just like unreal and I don't know where all these people get all this time on their hands. I mean, I was not that into social media personally before I got this job and I still do not spend that much time I mean I spend more time on my own social media now than I did before but I'm still not as obsessive about it as it seems like some of these other private users users are on the visit at Savannah accounts and it just baffles me um I just wish people would think before they hit enter so this is the one question that it's like everyone's sick of talking about and it also will kind of prevent this from being super evergreen but the elephant in the room is COVID-19 and... Uh, <coughs> Just kidding. <laughs> we're like socially distanced enough. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, it's kind of really hurt the travel industry. Yeah. And, um, like, how has it specifically affected managing the website and social? And, like, I know, like, I, I know a lot of this, but I probably don't even know the full extent of everything we had to do to like ad adapt our messaging and our story, the stories we tell. And I know mm -hmm. I'll, I'll let you talk. No. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, most of it, we have to look at everything with a magnifying glass. Everything has to be, I mean, and in 2020, there've been a lot of things that have happened in 2020 that have caused that, but we look at, and some of it's good, but we look at everything with a magnifying glass. Everything gets looked through 10 different lenses before it gets posted or published or scheduled. Um, just the tone, you know, we had to, and I pride ourselves, our team did that really well, I think, at the beginning of COVID-19. We immediately adjusted our tone and how we were talking to our audiences, and we were very mindful of not rubbing things in people's faces. We knew we were in a good destination and that we were better off than most, and um, but we were very mindful to try and be inspirational with that messaging and not just making people jealous and being, you know, kind of mean about it. Um, which or being is being like, come on down. Like, it's like, yeah, we were trying to be responsible, which is hard too, because I mean, we work for an organization that relies on people coming to our city, but ethically we were kind of trying to tell people not to come, um, it was really difficult, I think, for us from a content standpoint and a messaging standpoint. Um, I think across the board, we all just tried to adjust our sentiment and just empathize with the audience. Uh, 
which was good, but at the same time, it was really frustrating when the audience didn't always empathize with us as real people. Um, most of the time, people do, um, and there were some really awesome moments that we had with our audience connecting with them through the COVID crisis, um, but there were some really not awesome moments, too, and you kind of just have to take them all in stride. Um, so for other people that are maybe young people that don't know what they want to do or they think like, maybe I want to go into social, maybe I want to go into, maybe they're in school for marketing or PR or something. Um, like what's, what are some, some ways to either fast track their career or where can they go to kind of like learn more about how to get into it or how should they like get their dip their toes in for the first time I for almost, you it was very organic so. yeah i almost feel like not qualified to even answer that because it literally fell in my lap do so, you need a college degree yeah i would say nowadays you need a college degree to do social management um i don't know that you necessarily need a college degree in like communications or marketing with a specialization in digital if content. You were, if you were 17 and you could go back and you knew that this, like, you were going to go down this path, and so, rather than dance, like, what would you have studied? I suppose still would have done the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, I would have done the same thing. I don't personally believe in regrets like that. Like, I did what I did at the time because... Like yeah. yeah, I know. Um, you know, I, I did what I did because it was what I wanted at the time, and I knew that I had to do it at the that particular time, you know, I wasn't gonna be able to dance when I was 30. And I always just figured, you know, if or I could have, I mean, it, when I got old, and I just figured if I really felt so strongly that I wanted to go back to school for something else, then I would just do it down the road. Um, and I still agree with that. Um, I don't know what people can do now. I mean, I, th I really think that focusing on the strength in writing in social media is really important. I think people assume because it's digital and because it's born out of a, a casual connection experience the writing the strength of the writing isn't important and it couldn't be that could not be farther from the truth um you know we both know larissa allen our friend and former co-worker and she has a background in journalism and it showed so much and that's why she was able to develop such a strong voice on visits fan of social media before i came in and, and started handling it and she you know kept our website going really strong and she just had a really strong voice so i think anybody that's interested in being in social media or digital marketing needs to really focus on writing and just being flexible and being open to not just being stuck to social media all the time it's storytelling mm -hmm. yeah 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 people people connect with stories mm -hmm. and not just like we have great weather and we have great food and we have great scenery and right it's like <laughs> yeah. yeah you have to you have to be more like organic and authentic in in front of the phone or in f when you're typing or whatever it is that you're doing like it really has to come from somewhere a little bit deeper down mm -hmm. than the surface mm -hmm. so were there any mistakes you made that like i guess i i mean i know you would don't of course regret anything well i'll give you a little context about the college question because it's always like a trick question okay people say do you need to go to school to do what you do and i go no you don't need to go to college to do video production and podcasting. You can learn on you all on YouTube. Yeah. S seriously. I needed to go to school because I was I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. Right. And I had no discipline and I had no clear path and I mean I just like to skateboard and drink and uh <laughs> I can't skateboard but I do like to drink. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> That's so yeah. <laughs> so uh, so like for me, college was a uh, college was like the first time I was in class, and I was like, I was like, oh, everyone wants to be here. Like everyone wants to learn more about like holding a camera and like how to frame up a shot and like how to tell a story. And so I was just surrounded by other people that were like very passionate, and I was like. Oh, I'm like good at this. And so it wasn't like sitting in, I don't know, like history about, right. you know, so I was just like, I don't, I don't know. And so like, as I, as I got through school, and by the time I got out of school, I was involved in everything, like in all the extra stuff. So I don't think necessarily everyone needs to go to school to do like video and podcasting stuff. But like, if you're not sure, like first go to the military, but then second, I guess go to college. <laughs> 
<laughs> get some like discipline, some structure. <laughs> I mean, I need a haircut. So, and a haircut. So I never, I never, I never like, uh, I don't regret it. But like, yeah. I, you know, like if I, I guess like if I was just like my thirty year old self in my eighteen year old body, like I would be like, okay, I don't, I could learn all this online. Okay, yeah. So it is kind of funny to say that because both of my career paths thus far dance and social media no you don't need college to go do either one of those things i mean especially dance i knew full well when i was in dance getting a degree in dance at the time in my brain it was buying me time because that was right when the recession hit in 2009 Mm -hmm. um every tons of companies are folding there weren't any jobs and i just thought i'm just while i'm gonna be doing this i might pay a lot of money but at least i'm still taking class and i'm making connections and It'll just get me that much closer to, like, getting a job in a dance company eventually. Um, But you absolutely don't need a degree. And most dancers do not have degrees um, to dance in ballet companies. Same thing with social media. You absolutely don't need a degree. You can totally – I mean, I learned how to do everything just from the person that I was teaching me at my job in six months or whatever. Um, But to do it at the level that we're doing it at and to have the – at least experience in the organization that we do, even if that's not your forever job or your forever position or your forever company, um, to get your feet in the door, a degree is really helpful in either, well, I mean, probably not in dance, but, um, for social media, for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm sure the performance aspect of it has like come, come through in being a performer. Yeah. That's like the worst sentence I've ever said. The but performance aspect of social media yes, has like yeah. been informed by your education and like your passion for dance and being yeah. a, being a performer inherently. So again, no regrets. Like, no regrets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then uh, tell me like some cool brand accounts that are doing things right. Cool brand account. Okay, well, visit Savannah. Well, of Duh. Course. No, other than us, like inspiration okay, than for us. you. Um, I love. Sheets. <laughs> For gas station people out there, if you're from Pennsylvania, Sheets I, Gas Station. That's Sheets Gas you, Station is spelled S H E E T Z. They, I think, are branding geniuses. They've been reinventing themselves through the decades, like as it's become important. They were some of the first people to be in the digital space. They have a really strong social media presence, a really strong brand voice. It speaks directly to their audience and it has changed through the years. It has not stayed the same. They are constantly uh, looking at their insights and reevaluating who they're talking to and who they're trying to identify with. And it shows in the campaigns that they come out with. And I, to me, that's the mark of a really good brand. You know, they're not stagnant. They don't seem to be just stuck in their ways for a company that's, I don't know, they're, I think they're like 100 years old or something like No, not that old. They've been around since at least like the 50s, though. I mean, it's like a family business, right? And it's not just like grandpa doesn't understand the Facebook, so like we're not going to get on it. So it's almost core, part of their core business. Yeah, no, you know. they're like, they're way ahead of the game. Um, yeah, so I really respect them a lot. Um, my dream job is to run the Wendy's Twitter just because like there are no rules and you can say whatever you want without cussing and you don't have to respond to anybody if you don't want to. Um, some other really good brands. Oh, here's another really good one that I recently looked at. Um, Hinge, the dating app, their Instagram feed is hilarious. It's so funny. Mm. It perfectly reflects... And so subtly, the idea of Hinge, which is that they're kind of supposed to be like... And their product works. Their product works. I met my better half on Hinge. Shout out to Petey. Um, but no, they... Even if I... Even the, regardless of that, they... So they pride themselves on being like the app that's meant to be deleted. Like they want you to like find a person or whatever, mm-hmm. find happiness. Like mm-hmm. that's their whole thing. And they make fun of the ridiculous things that are in dating culture now in the 21st century and they like turn it into memes and in these into these like funny videos and they do it in a lot of really creative ways and then they put it all out on their social media accounts so they're not just promoting the app itself but they're promoting healthy dating culture and and really the ideals that the app stands for which i think is really cool and they do it in a really approachable way on their instagram account you said Mm mm-hmm cool yeah um let us 
go into a couple other little segues. Shannon is a Shannon, sorry, Shannon. Nicknames. Is a, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, she is a social media guru. She, uh, she, I mean, she's a mastermind. She's creative. She's, if you can't tell, she's got a wonderful personality. You are now like working towards kind of like helping um, uh, console businesses into how they can better perform on their social media channels. Like, tell me about that and how that's looking and moving forward and how that's going to go. Yeah. So I recently, with a lot of great advice and help from Tyler, um, have started to launch and am in the process of launching a private um, social media consulting and uh, creative agency. It's called On Point Creative. That's E-N-P-O-I-N-T-E. And it really just stemmed from, I've gotten a lot of great experience at Visit Savannah. I feel like I have a really good handle on the product that we're creating and that we're promoting and and the city and the destination and the the voice that we have and everything like that. I feel really comfortable with all of that. Um, And I still feel challenged in my job, but I just feel like to take it to the next level, I want to branch into some other businesses and some other industries and um, see how I can help other people uh, achieve the goals that we've achieved at Visit Savannah um, with the, the things that they're doing. Cool. So. And so no website yet, but at some point. No website yet, but there will be. How can people connect with you? Find me on LinkedIn right now. Um, but by the end of 2020, I will be on social media with appropriate handles for that agency name. and On, on Point Creative. On Point Creative. Cool. Mm-hmm. And I can link to that below as well. So. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I'm right now not focusing on a website. Just kind of get a social media presence out. Um and yeah, be this available. This is going to drop like um, beginning mid to January. So oh, perfect. She should, she should be on everything by now. So okay, I'll, I'll link below. Okay, so I'm by now when you're listening to this, find me on social media, not Twitter, just probably Facebook and Instagram. Cool. Okay. And then, um, is there anything else you wanted to plug? I mean, um, there's one thing I like feel like I'd be remiss like not to bring up, and that's like just like how fucking Irish you are. <laughs> As we drink whiskey right now. Yes, I'm really freaking Irish. I'm so proud of it. I love it. I mean, well, actually, I'm not that Irish. I'm like half German, but. But <laughs> spiritually, you're 100%. Whatever. In my brain, I'm 100% Irish. Uh, I'm straight off the boat from the Emerald Isle. Um, I play Gaelic football with our friend Caleb Harkle Road. Um, I just broke my nose playing, and it was awesome. And. Yeah, I love it. I love Irish music. St. Patrick's Day is my single favorite day of the year. If you're going to come to Savannah for something. If you come here for anything, it needs to be St. Patrick's Day. Um, Yeah, I love it. I want to move to Ireland. It's awesome. If there's anybody listening from Ireland, I'll be your social media manager. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be yeah. sick. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so, okay. So I'm going to close it up uh, with a little plug for the podcast. Okay. Um, upcoming episodes of The Creative Truth will include other creative career paths like artists, woodworkers, glass bowers, UX designers, photographers, VFX artists, and more. Uh, please subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening, leave us a good review on your favorite podcast platform. You can send suggestions for our podcast at wecreatetruth at gmail.com and visit us at creative-truth.com. Thanks, and we'll see you in the next one. Thank <laughs> you.